Uh-huh. You're in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hi, everyone. How y'all doing? Good. Hey, hi. <laughs> um, my name is Franny Choi. And my name is what, Danette Smith. That's uh-huh. what it yes, is. it yes. is. Yeah. Um, and we are so happy to get to welcome you to this event with uh, the one and only legendary Patricia Smith. Um, can we just make some noise for Patricia Smith? Woo! Right now? <laughs> okay, like, we should just do that at the top of every show. Yeah, you do. know, West Side legend, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, you know Winner of all things, all, in my things. Heart, all the things, all the things in my heart. You still can't win a poetry slam against her, not even this year. No. Mm-hmm. Um, should we read? So I think um, in uh, uh, the great tradition of poetry slam, where uh, <laughs> Patricia had her humble beginnings as a as an artist, um, we're gonna be put ourselves up as the sacrificial poets and uh, do a couple <laughs> poems before she gets out here. If that's okay with y'all, um, is it okay? Cool. Okay. No, it has to be because it's what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll read first. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. Um, oh, are you reading from your forthcoming co- collection, Homie? Well, Alan I am. Gray Wolf Press yeah, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> um, if you can't, if you're listening to this on the podcast, I'm currently Vanna Whiting, my own book. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is an almost sonnet. Um, an almost, you know, just a little bit over. Um, and I think it's right to read some form since Patricia Smith, I think, is our greatest formalist of our time mm-hmm. to welcome her to the stage. Um, so this is about one of my best friends. It's called I Didn't Like You When I met you. It's true. Um, But like the funk of a dude unwashed and sun whooped, I learned the need. And like dude, you were stank and I was stank right back. Two skunks pissed and pissing, smelling like skunks. But somehow, was it the mutual hate of a stanker fuck, a song our dueling shoulders found each other in, a synced nod, being the only of our kind in a room full of not us? Here we are, two stank bitches, thick as mothers, a little gone off love's gold milk. I didn't know when I thought, I don't like that hoe, that I was just my reflection I couldn't stand. I saw it, the way you would break me into a better me. I ran from it. Like any child, I saw my medicine and it looked so sharp, so exact, a blade fit to the curve of my name. What a shame. I was slow to you. Walked up to you like a bee trapped in a car. All that fear pent up in my wings, those screaming, swatting giants. And then, finally, the window, the wind, the flowers, the hive, my queen, my queen, my queen. Smith, everyone. Yeah. What you got, Francis? Okay. Um, here is what I brought. Um, I, I'm also going to read a, a, a sonnet. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll read the first and last sonnet in this crown, just Ooh. so that it feels there's some sort of like a false sense of closure that will happen. Oh, like most of my relationships. Oh. Mm. Right. <laughs> oh. Um, okay, yes. Yeah. So this is a, um, the Crown of Sonnets is called Chat Roulette. Do you all remember um, Chat Roulette? Yeah, people are being, I'm sorry to, trigger warning, Chat Roulette. <laughs> we will have to remember it. Um, uh, it. So for those who are not familiar with this phenomenon, this concept, uh, it was like a, a, an internet platform mm-hmm. where basically it would randomly match up your webcam with another webcam, mm-hmm. <laughs> which at first was like a fun way to have like cool conversations with You had people. conversations? For like, the, for the first few weeks it was conversations and then it was quickly just dicks. It was yeah. just dicks across the board. <laughs> That's um, where I came so in. So there's yeah. a... <laughs> 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 so, uh, in honor of Patricia Smith, I'll read some uh, <laughs> sexy, sexy and slightly disturbing sonnets. <laughs> um, yeah, the first one goes like this. To see, to come, I brought myself online. Oh, dirty church, oh, two-way periscope, refectory for Earth's most skin-starved cocks, oh, hungry sons of helicopter palms in a hopeful carousel, oh, gatling spray of skin that charges forth from dim-lit shorts when I wave back, nod, yes, I'm here, I'm real, and shape myself a woman's shape. A girl's live-action hologram projected on their basement brains. My foul amygdala prints thirstings, desperate congregations, pink or blue-brown mammals begging for my face. Outside the frame, my eight eyes narrow. Yes, I nod, amen, I am your filthy god. 
I think I'll just read that one. Yeah, just to, so no closure at all. Wait, no, no, <laughs> no. You got me all pent up. Yeah, like, that's right. Okay, that's cool. Right. All just right. like chat roulette. Um, <laughs> uh, we are so so excited to um, have this opportunity to talk to, to Patricia Smith yeah. today on this very special live uh, episode of Versus. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe. Versus fun fact, Patricia was supposed to read at our first ever live show a couple years ago and got sick. Um, but you know, um, the good Lord Jesus and Bugs Bunny have conspired. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Bugs Bunny feels like God to me these days. Have conspired okay. uh, to now. It's weird. Don't ask me. I'm <laughs> coffee high um, to get Patricia in here with us today. Uh, Franny, um, you know, we're both like kind of Patrician students. Um, sure. Yeah. What feels like the most Patricia Smith thing about your work? Oh, um, I think maybe it is the like s line between sexy and disturbing. Mm. Um, well, I think that it's like form being used to do both of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think I've learned there's like there's a sort of like um, there's like a seductiveness in the rigor of Patricia Smith's yeah. poems mm -hmm. that I kind of want to, I always want to try to fold into my own work. Word. I don't know. I This is at least aspirationally. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. What yeah. about you? A mountain we will never be able to climb. Truly. Um, for me, um, I think it is something about that rigor that you said. You know, I think yeah. um, what, what Patricia Smith's work does for me, um, it's beautiful to see a poet that you love continue to challenge themselves and really up the ante for themselves with yeah. every poem and every collection that you see coming out. Um, but as Patricia's rigor rises, I never feel like she's leaving behind the people who her poems are truly for, right? So um, it becomes so more intellectual, becomes more complex and more curious. Um, but at the center of her poems, I feel like are poems that are reaching back for a community that I think maybe uh, poets or the the the, aca, the structure of poetry maybe sometimes uh, forgets about yeah. and leaves out. And also, um, she made me want to be a formalist, you know? Like, as right. a spoken word poet, I used to be like, oh, fuck form, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's like what uh, the people that say that I can't write do and shit like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, what the fuck is a sustainer to me? Um, and then Patricia Smith was just like, well, you know, form is like how you get good. And I was like, wait, what you say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and so, and yeah. what a revenge, like the yeah. like, form as like revenge mm -hmm. on the people who said, you know, you can't write. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe she is, a, she may be even a poet of revenge, you know? Like, I, I never want to grudge her just because I'm scared about the poem she would write about. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, and so we, um, we're, 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 and we're both sort of like students of Patricia mm -hmm. Smith Very much in, so. for, in formal and informal ways. Mm -hmm. Like, we, I um, had the honor of taking a workshop with Patricia at um, the Vona workshop. Yep, yep, myself um, at Cave Cano. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, great to get a chance to bring our teacher on, um, yeah. our teacher and our, our and my mom. friend and our mom. <laughs> I, I lie and tell people that she's my biological mother sometimes, you know? Oh, Patricia Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, our family started at the Sam Plantation and here we are now, you know, <laughs> meeting each other <laughs> in the meantime. Oh, slavery happens. Come on. <laughs> Damn it, shit. Y'all yeah, yeah. know how I got this goddamn last name. <laughs> <laughs> shit. Tell them, tell them. All right, well, I don't think we should waste any more time. Yeah, we Everybody. should. <laughs> There's nowhere to go from that except for amazing poems by the one and only Patricia Smith. So please welcome up Patricia Smith, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy side, disturbing side. <laughs> <laughs> you can't show all that and say it ain't sexy. Well, hey. Okay. Hi, everybody. How's it going? We good? Hi. Handsome man up here. OK. So I figured I'm going to read two Chicago poems. Yeah. I love Chicago. I'm from Chicago. I miss Chicago. Uh, so uh, this is. Uh, Chicago, this is kind of patterned after the famous Carl Sandburg poem, right? Hi. Okay. Soul butcher for the country, heartbreaker, stacker of the deck, player with northbound trains, the nation's black beacon. Frigid, windy, sprawling, city of cold shoulders. They tell me you have lied and I believe them. For I have seen your Mississippi women stumbling Madison Street searching for their painted city legs. Mm. And they tell me you are evil. And I answer, yes, I know. 
I have seen babies cooking their hair, figuring blades, changing their names to symptoms of jazz. And they speak of souls you swallow, and my reply is, on the shadowed faces of men in the factory lines, I have witnessed the beginnings of the furthest falling. And having answered so, I turn to the people who spit at my city, and I spit back at them before I say, Come and show me another city with head thrown back, wailing bladed blue, field hollers, so astounded to be breathing and bleeding, spewing electric hymns rhythmed against the staccato pound of fiery steel presses. Here is a defiant ass whooper shaking its massive fist at sweating southern towns, feral as a junkyard mutt, taut, muscled against his enemy, shrewd as an explorer pitted against an untried land, wily as a Louisiana boy faced with days of concrete, hmm. wiry-headed, digging, destroying, deciding, swallowing, expelling, swallowing, under the rubble, thrusting forth, laughing with perfect teeth, shedding the terrible burden of skin, laughing as a white man laughs, laughing even as a soldier laughs, addicted to the need of his next battle, laughing and bragging that under that skin is the cage of his ribs, and under his ribs beats the whole unleashed heart, laughing, laughing the frigid, windy, sprawling laughter of a southern man, folded against the cold, sparkling, sweating, proud to be, soul butcher for the country, heartbreaker, stacker of the deck, receiver of northbound trains, and the nation's black beacon. Mm. You don't have to applaud. Thank you. All right, so I grew up on the west side. Thank you, thank you. I grew up on the west side, and um, so, you know, the street slicing through that is Madison Street, although the last time I was on Madison Street, I didn't recognize it. I won't tell you why. Uh, so I, I tried to figure out what would it be like to to introduce people to a ride on the Madison Street bus. And this was back when I was growing up. So that's what this poem is. Tavern, tavern, church, shutter tavern, then Goldblatt's with its finger smeared display windows full of stifled plaid pinafore and hard tailored serge, each unattainable thread cooing the delayed lusciousness of layaway. Another church then, of course, Jesus pitching a blustery bitch on every other block. Then the butcher shop with, hard to believe, the blanched archaic head of a hog propped upright to lure waffling patrons into the steamy innards of yet another storefront where they drag their feet through sawdust and revel in the come hither bouquet of blood. Then a vacant lot, then another vacant lot, right up against a shoe store specializing in unyielding leather, all stars and glittered stacked heels designed for the Christian woman daring the jute box. Then the what not joint with vanilla iced long johns, wax lips crammed with sugar water, notebook papers, swollen sour pickles buoyant in a splintered barrel, school supplies, pixie sticks, licorice whips, and vaguely warped 45s by Fontella Bass or Johnny Taylor. Now, ooh, what's that blue pepper? Piercing the air with the nouns of backwood and cheap delta cuts, neck and gizzard, skin and claw, it's the chicken shack, wobbling on a foundation of board, grease riding relentless on three of its walls, the slick cuisine served up in virgin white cardboard boxes with Tabasco nibbling the seams, scorched wings under soaked slices of wonder, blind perch fried limped, spiced like it's a mistake Mississippi done made. And speaking of, July moans around a perfect perfume tangle of eight Baptist gals on the corner of Kedzie and Warren, fanning themselves with their own impending funerals. Fluid filled ankles like tree trunks sprouting from narrow slingbacks, choking in Sears best cinnamon tinged hose, their legs so unlike their arms and faces. On the other side of the street is everything they are trying to be beyond, everything they are trying to 
ignore the great promise of government, 25 floors of lined windows, of peeling grates called balconies, of yellow panties and shredded diapers fluttering from open windows, of them nasty gals with wide avenue hips stomping double dutch in the concrete courtyard, spewing their woman verses, too fueled and irreversible to be not listened to and wiggled against, and the Madison Street bus revs its tired engine, backs up a little for traction, and drives smoothly into the sweaty space between their legs, the only route out of the day that we're riding through. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Patricia. Thank you. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for joining us. You are this welcome. Special episode of Versus. Mm -hmm. This is snuggly already. I know. Ain't it? And these chairs is comfortable. I do mm -hmm. have to say, I might <laughs> steal one. After. I've got to figure it out. Yeah. Um, well, let's start off where we start off with all our guests on Versus. Uh, Patricia, what's moving you? <sighs> what's moving me? Uh, I think what is moving me right now is the fact that. Um, Truth is in extremely short supply. Ooh. I am uh, thinking of poets as the ultimate truth tellers, mm. and I'm trying to figure out what other ways I can write to bring people to the circle. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking about some things that came out of my last book, Incendiary Art, where I was thinking about the, the mothers of people who had been uh, murdered often by the police but not always and uh, I'm thinking now about expanding that and writing some short fiction mm -hmm. with each story focused on a different situation with one of those mothers. I think it's another way to maybe get some work out that will get the com keep the conversation going because as you know uh, black people and black people concerns are not high on the priority list of the current administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, God to damn. put it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you said to uh, to bring people into the circle, can you say what you mean exactly by that? Uh, not too long ago, somebody, um, they asked me, they were talking about the, the uh, sometime prohibitive emotional content of the mm -hmm. work, that it would be very difficult to read and then read again, and how I, I, I build myself up to go out and read mm -hmm. pieces like that over and over again. And I think eventually you get to the spot where you realize that there are a lot of people who don't realize that we have this, uh, what I like to call the second throat. You know, we can live our lives over here and then we have the ability to analyze that life, to pick it up and to go behind it and mm -hmm. to see why it moves the way it does. And not everyone realizes that they can do that. So um, what keeps me reading work like this is thinking in every audience there's at least one person who needs to hear, maybe it's something that's a line that's inconsequential in your poem, mm. but something where they realize, I have felt like that too, mm. and didn't know there was a way to express it, and maybe they run home and they pick up a pen, or they go to another reading, or, you know, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get this huge community of witnesses, mm. you know, because if no one is witnessing, no stories are really being told. Mm. You know, and so it's on a personal level where someone who's dealing with something that's very difficult realizes there's another way that they can get on the other side of it. But the other thing is there's so many conversations that are being shut down that we need to keep happening. And if we don't say our fears and our angers and all these things out loud, uh, we too are being suppressed. You mm -hmm. know, So when I talk about growing the community, it's those conversations that we need to have with each other that uh, you know we need to talk about you know why we hurt or why we don't want to you know have our voice on the air or whatever. Mm. So um, I I think that by doing work that's accessible and work that comes from simple places, mm -hmm. like I I don't try to do anything overly. I mean it's I think they're all real stories, and so my feeling is hey. I'm gonna come out and tell you what happened to me today or, or how, how I feel about this thing and whatever. And I think it's a conversation more than anything else where I expect somebody to stand up and go, hey, you know, me too, let me tell you how I feel about it. So it's just kind of an artful way to begin that conversation. And every time we do, and it's like throwing a fish hook out. Mm. 
-hmm. and you pull it back and there are people clinging to it and ideas clinging to it, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, every time someone takes one of those ideas and runs with it, the community gets larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you balance um, that sort of accessible entry point um, of the work, right? Telling these simple stories, like, and really, I think your work does call forth people to realize that they can be poets, that they can tell the truth, that there is a truth out there that they can reach for. How do you balance that with your own quest for excellence and rigor? I think you're a poet that I, I hear often talk about trying to challenge yourself in the work. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you balance that challenge for yourself with that accessibility for who you're trying to call into the circle? Well, a lot of times the work that you're trying to write and make accessible is difficult work. It's work people don't really want to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I, um, when I did the book about Katrina, nobody wanted to hear about Katrina anymore. You know, mm -hmm. people were tired of it. Uh, I don't think anyone, you know, there's a bunch of people who say, yes, I understand that, you know, black men and women are being murdered. I understand that there's a problem with the police. There's a problem in the neighborhoods. I've heard a lot about it, uh, you know, so, I figured out that what you have to do is you, sometimes you can't draw people into the poems with the subject matter. Mm. So you have to figure out, uh, the, the reason I studied form was I, I want to pull you into the poem with technique and then have you realize that you're in a place that you wouldn't have chosen for yourself. Mm. You know, so for instance, um, writing about uh, something that was very personal to me, and it was when I, I realized that my mother had, uh, uh, when I was young, my mother used to scrub the back of my neck with Lysol, because I, I was too black. I would come in in the summer and I was too black, and so she'd make me sit in the kitchen chair and she'd put some of that in the little red bottle that undiluted Lysol concentrate on a washcloth, and she would scrub the back of my neck. And, um, and I said, how am I going to tell that story, you know? And I fought with it. I fought with it. I said, okay, maybe it's not my story to tell. And then I picked up the Lysol, and I was reading the directions on the back. And I decided, and this goes two ways. It's my way of entering the story mm. that I don't want to tell mm. and my way of giving the audience, a, you know. And so I just started talking, just quoting the directions, you know. So it's, it's a little bit of sleight of hand. Mm. I'm about to talk to, about something you, don't, you want to walk away from, but I need to do something technically to pull you into the poem and keep you there so you can hear this story. Mm. So uh, the, the, the challenge, it's like I, I picture 800 people walking to their keyboards or their notebooks or whatever to write the exact same poem I'm about to write because we all have the same idea. So how is it that I'm oh, going you to write it? Sure that that seems like a hard thing to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm be sorry. Like, oh my that. God! I wouldn't. Now I give up. Yeah, I wouldn't do it if I just pictured like Ilya Kaminsky walking up to his computer to write the same shit. I'd be like, I'm done. Like, well, He's I got guess it. Ilya's poem now. <laughs> yeah, the, the poems are the poems are on the open. You know, and there's been a lot of times when you know I've clicked on something on Twitter or. I've heard some people talking about a reading, and I was like, damn it, Dennis, you know? <laughs> it's like, I, you know. Or uh, an idea that I didn't have, and, and, you know, you guys do the same thing. It comes from very simple, uh, this happened to me the other, you know. And, and I look at it, and I go, this is where, this is where the work is. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, relegated to a dusty bookshelf somewhere. It's not something where you have to sit like this and wait for inspiration to fall down on your heads. It's right in front of you mm. all the time, you know? And, uh, and the only thing I did is like I studied, I studied form. I studied form because people were talking to me like other, other people owned form. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I could look at, but and I was like, you gotta be kidding me, right? So especially because I came out of the spoken word thing, it's like, that's really cute what you do. Now we're gonna go over here and do some real poetry. Mm. You know, and so I, there would be poems that I would come to again and again and read over and over and over. What is it? What is it? What is it? Then I realized it was something the poet was doing technically mm -hmm. to help heighten my response to that poem. Mm -hmm. So I think we all owe it to ourselves. All of the canon belongs to us. It's not in bits and pieces that, okay, we'll let you have this now. It always belonged to us. Mm -hmm. It's just that I think coming from spoken word, we had to convince ourselves mm -hmm. 
that it belonged to us. You know, and so after that, uh, form is just something, it's something I have in my toolbox. I think we all have uh, poems that we carry around and they're not working, and they're not working, and we don't know why. And I think that sometimes it's, it's because they're asking for something we do not yet know how to do. Mm -hmm. So I think we owe it to ourselves. It's like, why, why, why? I need, oh, I need a, you know, repetitive form. Let me get this Villanelle. Let me get this Sestina out of mm -hmm. here. You know, so it just gives us, it gives us more options, but it also does help me take what could be really kind of explosive, emotionally explosive material and come around the back way mm -hmm. to, to get to it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, that makes sense, you know, as you said, for engaging with, with the stories that are hardest to tell or the hardest mm -hmm. to listen to. Um, does that make it easier as well in the process of sharing those poems? Like, I mean, you talked a little bit about like the kind of like emotional toll of sharing, mm -hmm. sharing poems with such um, emotionally heavy content. Um, yeah, does form help with that or, or if not, then uh, what does? Yeah, form helps with it sometimes, uh, but a lot of it depends on my yesterday and my week before and what's in the news and you know uh, that brings a lot of those things much closer to the surface mm. so while I realize oh this thing has just happened so I really need to read this poem mm. I understand that everybody's feelings are kind of raw around that right now you know mm. uh, so I you know I don't claim to be totally in, the, in control of the poems all the time mm. um, there have been poems that I started and didn't finish. Uh, there have been faces that come to me in the midst of a poem from a news story I saw the night before and then I realize, oh, this has happened again mm -hmm. and everyone's thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it indeed is that uh, the fact that we are suppressing so many of the conversations we need to have and if I can just start that conversation even the poems that I begin and don't finish, uh, I think we all feel that way. But it's so easy for us to pave things over and go, I'm, sh I'm glad that's over. I'm glad I've gotten past that. Mm -hmm. We've gotten past nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, once you, once you begin to develop that second throat, you know, you turn around and the pavement's going like this. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. come back. You've got to, you can't move on without addressing mm -hmm. these things. You know, and I, I want to help uh, my audience and my readers find a path to that to that addressing. So I think it's important to get through with the poems. There's things that I haven't that that I haven't. I'm afraid to write about. Mm. There are things that uh, uh, I I write not only for you know for, for this or I write to kind of move sanely from one day to the next in my own life. And and there are still things that that I'm afraid of. But I think if I'm afraid there must be other people that are afraid. So I will look for the work or else I will seek to write it myself. Wow, Patricia Smith is scared or something. That shit blows my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, another question on form, um, though maybe, uh, and maybe we could turn away after this, but maybe not, it's our show and we will geek out about form if we fucking feel like it. Right. Um, so I think a lot of your work, you know, from project to project, you sort of volley back and forth between um, you know, a work like Should Have Been Jimmy Savannah, which is like highly confessional, personal, right? Um, and then works like Blood Dazzler or Incendiary Art, which are maybe a little bit more like looking up at the world and uh, pulling in voices that are not, or experiences that aren't your own. Um, does the utility um, of what form does for you feel different between some of those more confessional, personal projects and then poems that are sort of addressing a larger world concern? Um, no, I think what it is, it, it's, it's very much from poem to poem. Mm. You know, uh, one of the things that studying form made me realize was how much power we actually have as poets, how much power we have for how the reader comes to the page. Yeah. Everything from how the actual poem appears on the page to uh, line breaks, mm -hmm stanza, you know, if, if I want you to be breathless after reading this, if I want you to muse. So if, I, if I'm writing something about myself, uh, and for instance, in Jimmy Savannah, I was trying to really kind of recreate the life of my, uh, my parents. And sometimes you want to create uh, 
attention. You want something that should people think should be loose and boundless to be very tight and you know so the reader can't turn away from it mm. um in in should have been jimmy savannah for instance uh not should have been jimmy savannah blood dazzler uh i wanted to write that um persona poem about ethel freeman mm -hmm. uh if you saw the pictures at, at uh, katrina there was a woman who died in her wheelchair uh, she was waiting with her son for the, a bus to come and take them from the convention center. On the freeway, center. correct, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, she kept saying, is it coming, baby? Is it coming? And he covered her against the sun. And then the bus came and she had died. And they told him that if she, he didn't come with them, they, would, they didn't know if they'd be able to come back and get him. So he had to leave his mother's body there. So I, I, I thought about how, how elderly people talk. They have these comfort spots in their language and mm -hmm. they circle back around on them, mm -hmm. say a lot of the same things in the same. So I said, okay, and this is, a, this is how form works. I need for her to keep coming back around to things. So I need a form that does that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, let's try the Sestina. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I, I, I'm grateful that I have form to address um, personal things because a lot of them are things that I never thought would see the light of day. Mm. And I can kind of trick myself into entering them by concentrating on the form. Mm. You know, it's the same way when I, when I teach, I, I do a, a workshop called uh, Writing on the Other Side of the Wall. And you try to get people over there where they, they claim they can't be. Uh, and the first thing I have, I said, what's the thing you can't write about? And they all have something and I say, okay, tell me again, but tell me in a limerick. Right, mm -hmm. and so they're counting the syllables, mm -hmm. and they're you know they're doing things, and uh, and then once they read that, I said, okay, now you have a choice. You're on the other side of the wall. You can stay over there, or you can run back. Mm. You know, so sometimes it's just tricking people into knowing themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and knowing what they're capable of. Uh, so yeah, it's it is it is poem it's poem to poem, and, and plus because in Blood Dazzler I had Katrina, I personified Katrina. And so there was kind of a human overlay mm -hmm. over the event that, that uh, wouldn't have been there so strongly if I haven't, hadn't done that. And so I w each, each poem I was thinking, okay, how is she approaching this? How does she feel? Uh, is she petulant? Is she hesitant? Is mm -hmm. she, you know, and then the form that matched would come to mm -hmm. the surface. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, th your um, explanation of that prompt or writing assignment for your students remind me, reminded me of um, a prompt that you, a sort of legendary prompt that you Woo! have given both of us. It's quite the fucking it's retired. prompt. <laughs> Is it? Oh, it's retired? I think so. Well, can you tell us, can you tell us um, or tell the audience about what the prompt was and then maybe why you retired it? This is a, <laughs> this is a brutal, this is a brutal exercise. Okay. okay. <laughs> all right. So you come into workshop, you're all happy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I say, God, I said, you know what? We really should be thankful that we're able to come here and do this. And I know we do it with the support of people who love us. Oh I said, okay, up. so I, what I want to do today, just to get a good feeling in the room, I want everyone here to tell me who they love most in the world. I said, you know, don't worry. Don't try to choose between children. Just, just. Tell, you know, and so we go around and they say, oh, my mother Louise and my father Ed and all that. And I said, okay, so let's just say it all together once, just shout their names out in the room. And they go, Ed, Louise, ah, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, let's get down to work. Uh, now we can do the workshop. So um, I, I, I talked to them about everyone has something they know they should be writing that they're not writing. And we do the little limerick thing. You know, I said, well, can, can we do this? And they come out with the limericks. Um, I have to tell you this. Can I tell them this one limerick? Yeah. yeah. One student, she had been psychologically abused by her mother for years, uh, almost to the point of violence, but not quite. And her father was just like the briefcase in the background, you know. And I said, you ever written about that? She said, no. So the limerick she wrote, oh, the one time she thought her mother was actually going to hurt her. And uh, she wrote this limerick. Uh, backed into a corner I stood. She'd kill me this time, swore she would. Waving the knife, 
my mother, his wife, I screamed, and my father said, good. <sighs> so I said, okay, you're on the other side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you want to keep writing? But anyway, okay, everybody writes the limerick, and then everybody shares what it is that they can't write about. And then I, exp I, I tell them, okay, now we're going to do a process poem. A process poem has an act, uh, a process at its heart. So my process poem is uh, cooking in the kitchen with my father. And it has a recipe in the center of it, you know? So it's like if you're teaching someone to ride a bike, you go, first you put your feet, and then you build the poem up around the process. So everybody writes a process poem, and we're all happy. So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to write a process poem. Uh, and I want, where you are, you are outside of a room. You open the door, and the room is very cold and clinical. It's all silver and white, and you're not sure where you are first, but there's a, a slab in the center of the room, and you go toward the slab. And on that slab is the naked and lifeless body of the person you named as loving most in the world. Ain't right? <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> and, your, <laughs> and your job is to dress them for burial. And yeah, people. <laughs> and so it has to be, it has to be, and the, and the problem is it has to be a very slow, I mean, you know, some people said, oh, and then I put on the skirt, then blouse, I was done, you know. But no, it has to be lifting the arm, it's noticing scars, it's, it's men seeing their mother's body for the first time. It's sliding sleeves up. It's the, the clothes you choose, why you chose those particular clothes. And you can go off on a tangent and talk about a time you had together, but you always have to come back to the room and complete the task. And I've had people say, oh, well, I opened the door and I threw a Molotov cocktail in and everybody, threw, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so that was it. And, and you know why I'm retiring it? Uh, I'm retiring it because uh, I, I had done it so much that uh, the students had started to cycle around. Like <laughs> I'd, I'd have somebody in a workshop and I'd have it all prepared and go, oh no, I can't, you know. So it's, and it's in a book and I just thought, you know. But uh, it, my whole thing is people say they can't write the difficult things. Mm. And if you can write that, I think you can write anything. Mm. I mean, <laughs> I'm just over here. I got, I got PTSD like, from what I had to do the prop one the time. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's still stuck with me. Oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about you as a teacher, though. Uh, okay. you know, um, I mean, me and Franny have both had you. You're a, you're a grand and difficult teacher. Um, and I think you've always, uh, for one thing I've always appreciated about you is that since, like, day one when I met you, I was all the 19 years old. Um, we go I, way back. Way back, way back, way back. When you pay no old dad and was fresh faced. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I was still bisexual. It was a lot. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> born a bisexual, I'll die a lady. Okay. Um, so, um, but one thing I've always appreciated about you is that, like, no matter how much. Um, we have looked to you as like either a big homie or a mentor or a teacher. You've always kind of treated us like peers in a way. You and are. I mean, but that's like. <laughs> okay, but why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> How? <laughs> I guess where does that come from? Like, I don't know. It's so, it's so interesting to us that like there isn't this hierarchical difference. And I guess maybe the question to make it not like explain why you're nice. Um, <laughs> I guess what what do you find yourself? Um, learning from a younger generation of poets that makes you approach them in that way? Hmm. Uh, I think uh, a lot of this, uh, I, I got introduced to poetry by getting up on stage and doing it. I was very kind of uh, not sure where my route was and, and, and actually got introduced to the Green Mill here in Chicago and went to the Green Mill. Yeah, so clap it up for the Green Mill, yeah. Uh, went to the Green Mill for years and years, and uh, it is the great equalizer. You know, you have a lot of older people, you have someone who just got out of jail for murder, you have somebody who uh, bags groceries, you have a house, you know, and everyone thought 
that there was something in their, I mean, ev- there was something in everyone's life that drove them there on Sunday mm-hmm. to be able to tell this story to a room full of strangers. So it never occurred to me that someone else's story was not worthy, was mm-hmm. not worth. It, it wasn't that you had to be a perfect poet. It's like, here are people who were listened to me, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes something would happen nationally. I remember the Oklahoma City bombing and everybody came there and they all had these really kind of fevered poems about, you know, that they had written that day to try to work that out, you know. So, um, and it, it also comes from being uh, being alive the same time Gwendolyn Brooks was alive, mm. who would come to readings and sit in the front and and talk to students and kids as they left the stage and quote something a line from their poem which of course they will never forget but realizing that i can't just have the stories of people who are like me be legitimate stories Mm. you know uh, when i was you know when i first met you when i was 19 nothing was going on in my head creatively Mm. you know and i feel like that was a very charged time where i i missed uh the, I, my, my daddy was a storyteller, so there was like this, this huge gap where I didn't realize that my stories were legitimate, mm. you know? And uh, one of the first things that I think everybody should learn is that there are no stories that don't count. Mm. Okay, so when I met you, you were already a poet. Yeah. You know, you were in a program, you were doing all these things, you know? But then, if I go to a grade school in Camden, New Jersey, and a kid says, well, I, I'd like to write a poem, but I, because I, but I can't because I don't get good grades. Mm. You know, I can't because I can't spell, you know. And to be able to tell them, I'm waiting. I'm going to wait right here for the poem you're going to write. Mm. And we're going to read it together, and then we're going to bring it out, you know. So um, there's always been something that someone who is not me can teach me. You know, um, and, and that's that's from people who are writing their first poem to you guys. And I was energized by uh, uh, when I was first got into the slam, mm-hmm. uh, f- just trying so hard, to, feeling you're just at the 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 edge of something amazing and wonderful, and then realizing that slam could become a great teaching tool. And mm-hmm. what you were doing when you were in school, that you know the whole first wave thing. And that was amazing to me that that even existed, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, I just thought I have my voice, but that idea of growing community and hearing something in your poems that I can admire and love and maybe fold into my signature a little bit, mm-hmm. the whole idea, and, and, and the whole idea of, when you, you guys come out on a stage and it's storytelling, you know, and uh, and I knew that you had a great reverence for the traditional as well, and that's what when I was in Slam, that's the meld I wanted to see. Mm. You know, so uh, you every time I read something or hear something from you guys or from people who are just getting into poetry because of you, uh, I learned something. Mm. You know, so that whole idea, it's so funny, the whole idea about hierarchy. I lost a really good friend who um, I had gotten invited to, to read in the Library of Congress with Natasha. Natasha was finishing her first term, and we thought she was leaving. So she had a thing, Louis Rodriguez, some other people. And I was like, I'm at the Library of Congress. I'm whirling around in her chair like, <laughs> Poet Laureate, you know, <laughs> having a grand old of people looking at me like, you know, and that's the thing. It's just like, have fun, you know what? And, and so I, I do this reading, and uh, I had a friend there with me, kind of a fun, funky friend, you know. Mm-hmm. And after that reading, I guess we were all going to go out, and she kind of started to back up and, you know, and I was like, what's happening? And the thing was, well, you know, you have those friends now. You know, mm-hmm. you have, you're hanging out with poet laureates, and you're, I don't want to get, I don't want to get in my way. Are you kidding? You know, so people expect for you to become something else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and for everything's a surprise 
this like to me. I don't strategize. I don't try to, you know, say, oh, I wonder who's judging this contest. You know, I mean, it's, it's just if you are, if you're impassioned about it and you keep doing it because you're impassioned, good stuff's going to happen. Mm. It, you know, it just happens, you know, and, uh, and I see that say, that's another thing about you guys. It's like we can be out, well, they can be out on the dance floor. Uh, <laughs> we, could, we, could be, we could be out somewhere. Let's do this. Let's have this. I laugh. I get crazy. I love it. And there are people who were like, Patricia, you know, she hangs out with the, you know, as if I'm trying to like, you know, sap youth juice from you guys. Or Take yeah. it, please. Yeah. please. You know, and, and, and it's because youth juice. why am I? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole other direction this could go. Uh, and it's, it's like, that's, that's where the life is now. I mean, everybody else is, you guys are taking yourself so seriously and, and you're studying who's at the top and who's at, the, you know. And this is not a place for that. It's it's just not a place for that. So I I think, I think what happens is, uh, we we waited so long. Those of us who who started on stage waited so long for legitimacy, mm. uh, that some people still wait. And then mm. and then when they get it, it's like, well, no, I am. It's like, yeah. no, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's, I I've chosen to stay centered in in this life stay centered that doesn't mean that there's some hierarchy that I'm there's something I'm trying to climb it means that I'm going to stay where the life is mm -hmm. you know where people are still energized and electrified by words that come out of someone's mouth mm -hmm. and they go home and they say damn it if I can't do that it's never you know I've seen people get up and say I am poet you are audience I have come to impart my, you know, it's like, <laughs> shut the, f you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they put the book in front of their faces and drone for 45 minutes and you, sh and you are now changed, <laughs> 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 you know, and it, it, it's just, it, so, so the, I, I think that it, I, I think that we're, we're all, you're, you're part of the community that keeps me, uh, Keeps me alive in a way. Yeah. Keeps me rooted and centered and 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 it keeps the work makes real. It me sounds like. always remember not only where I came from, but why I came. Yeah. Mm. To this place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. That was great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, should we should we move? Mm -hmm. Okay, this cool. This is Mike Wallace, and this is Morley Safe. Wow. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, okay, well, I think that um, it would be great to hear, hear you read one more poem, Patricia, and then for us to move to a little game, and then um, we, can, we can close out. It's a hazing thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, can I read from here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I f you know what? I forgot I was going to do a lot of other poems, so I'm going to do this thing that, you, that always irritates you when poets do this. <laughs> Oh, is that too long? <laughs> we got time. No, it's, uh, it's all right. Okay, so this is a, this is a race thing. <laughs> a race thing? Are you this black? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't see color, so. I don't <laughs> see color. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Hair by gray, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when I, was, when I was growing when I was in Chicago, uh, Husband, incoming call. So what? Okay. He's going to listen to this later. Okay, I want everybody to say, hi, Bruce. One, two, three. Hi, hi Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> she just hung up. Amazing. He's like, hi, everybody. Yeah, he wants to get into a conversation now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, he's calling back. No. <laughs> so uh, when I, I went to school on Milwaukee and Addison, I went to Schur's. So my, um, my parents thought that they put me in a transfer program. I'm doing a show, honey. I'll call you back. <laughs> 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 I 
Okay. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so yeah, my, my parents thought it was like a, you know, there was a, a transfer program where you could go to a school that was outside of your neighborhood. And my parents thought, well, we have to send her to a white school because they're all good. Not. Um, I went to a school that had like a graduating class of like 800 people, and it was a bad white school. I know those exist. So, um, but I was, I was very confused racially because I would get on the bus on the west side. I'd go all the way across the city. And so I was one person on the bus, and then I had to be another person over here. I was in try high why, you know? Uh, so I had a guy I had a crush on, mm -hmm. and he was white, and he had blue eyes, like all the Jesuses at church. <laughs> and so, and his name was Jimmy Canole, and so this is, is he here? <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Jimmy Canole. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Jerry Springer, you know. Jimmy, you know, he comes out, and I try to strangle him. And you want to ask your advice? Okay. <laughs> Dear Jimmy Canole. Dear Jimmy Canole, who snatched an ill-fitting but culturally snug Afro wig from my head while I stood in the chow line on a Tuesday at roughly 12.30 p.m. at Carl Schur's High School on the northwest side of Shy. Okay. Maybe you suspected that it was just a weirdness plopped atop me. You couldn't have known that the damn thing wasn't anchored down by bobby pins or that my real hair was flat, platted, dusty, and matted beneath because that Tuesday, all I cared about was the sheen that showed, not the shameful itch beneath. The stated color of the wig, Jet Black 1A, was actually two shades too black for me, just some cheap tangle meant to imitate real hair, because real hair cost up in the dollars, and I was just stalking the kink anyway, the natural ignored root. I didn't want to rattle anybody. Dear Jimmy, I was your public personal curiosity, mantle ready and scrub skinned in your presence, aching through the ritual of try high Y and Latin club. Every word I spoke tilted obediently up at the end, I was a thing with no color. But it was 1970, a year with its stupid fist in the air. And since my hair was the only thing I couldn't change, yes, I still believe that pesky skin thing could be negotiated. I surrendered to letting those naps say Negro out loud. There it was, undeniable, shifting as I stumbled, the front itching down, inching down my forehead, the back lifting for a flash, a private nodding. Oh, no, I was way too big a slice of colored. Something had to be done. Jimmy, how noble of you to take it upon yourself to slap me back to center, to staunch my wacky revolution. What courage it took for you to confront that most formidable wrong. Remember? when you held me in your arms. You were chaperone at a freshman dance, and by then I was so in love with you, my ribs ached from struggling to hold that huge sin in. A downbeat, you with arms outstretched, and I signed myself over, told myself maybe he, maybe I, dared a maybe we, prayed me pale and pliant, prayed you'd wash me woman with that stabbing blue Jesus gaze. When the music stopped, your mouth touched my cheek, and I dizzied myself writing, dreaming, building whole futures on that blazing square of skin. Now I know you were aping the room over my shoulder, goo goo jungle mug, look at me rocking the world of the colored girl. Later. I I bet you laughed, mocked how my hips sought yours, bubbled your perfect lips obscenely, hooted monkey. Dear Jimmy Canole, did you talk about it with your friends? Did you snicker and plan? Did you think about the second after, whether you would drop the wig at my feet or run away holding it high over your head? You held it out and I took it. And all my air became pointing fingers, open mouths, shout from the windows, laughing from the floorboards, guffaws from the wiry crown uncurling in my hand. You stood your ground, smiled sweet simply, urged me to understand. I looked numbly at the thing that I held. Suddenly I was blacker than I ever was, colored all over everything. Negro was unleashed. Jigaboo came tumbling down. Jungle Bunny came out of hiding. My real hair unflattened in new air, popped its day of dust and spraying corkscrews, lending the drama its only motion. I opened my mouth to drown you in raging, ripped deep gash through the god of you, but all that came out, stunned for all this time, were the first three words of this poem. Patricia Smith. Wow. Thank you.
I could have read something funny. It's fine. I'm angry now. Fuck Jimmy Cano, you Fuck know. Jimmy Cano. I hope he does show Don't think I didn't try ass. to look his ass up, too. Look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not opposed to jumping people <laughs> to this day. I could have read something <laughs> funny. Everybody's like, okay, thank you for that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we move to uh, the last portion of, our, of this event, which is playing a little game, um, speaking of fighting, uh, we just wanted to ask actually for, um, for like a quick piece of advice. Yeah. <laughs> For from you to us, mm -hmm. um, uh, which mentor is, us. Yes, please mentor us. Um, which is that? So this is like a, th a thing that um, interviewer after after interviewer seems to be obsessed with whenever they talk to us. Which is the sort of like question of slam and of spoken word. Mm -hmm. It's always like a how do you know when you're writing a a spoken word poem versus a page People poem. People are obsessed People, with that, right? Aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. like, how do you like? Do you perform? Do you know how you're gonna perform it when you write it and stuff? Um, <laughs> and just sort of like, they can't seem to let it go. The like spoken word past and like present yeah. of our lives. Yeah. So like, I guess the question is like, how how do you <laughs> deal with that, or what do you do with that obsession? You know, just oh, what was I? Oh, I was just in. Um, was it? Was it Newcastle or it was London? Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm English city. <laughs> no, no, I was just in the UK and I'm trying to figure out which stop this. It was London. Flex. So I was. I, <laughs> was it London? I, was it Milan? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I had done. I, I was had, lecturing at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Cambridge. <sighs> I got Sorry, advice. I got advice for you too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so I did this reading, and they said, oh, we're going to talk to you afterwards. And I swear, the guy turned to me, and I saw it in his eyes, and the first question was, when you slam, which is something <laughs> I haven't done. The slam is a competition, right? right? And so they, they, they call slam poetry the type of poetry that used to win the competition, which just meant that you usually didn't have the paper in front of you. You emoted. You actually looked like there was an audience out there, you know, something like that. Um, so it used to make me really angry because I realized that slam is kind of the trendy, sexy thing. Mm -hmm. And if you are looking for someone to come talk to your students or something like that, and they have questions, I've learned to kind of grit my teeth and say, okay, let's talk about slam for a while. Uh, but it's something you do on the way to something else, or it should be, mm -hmm. you know, although I do know some people who are like 50 years old who are still sleeping on people's couches and doing past the hat mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, you know, you realize, okay, this is where I decide, is this something I want to do for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. Do I want to do poems publicly? Mm -hmm. And if so, what is the next step from here? And when I told you that I, I started to look at people and say, oh, there's a whole technical aspect to this that I know nothing about, that's where I decided to go and this meld the two. Mm -hmm. So what I think we all do relatively well is we know how to handle a mic. We know how to read and have a, a, a conversation with an audience, a creative conversation with the audience. Uh, I know how to go into a bar where the, the uh, cappuccino machine is going at full <laughs> speed and I know what to do if the mic is broken. I know, you know. Uh, but I think we need to realize and accept that it's, it's going through phases, but it's always going to be there. People are fascinated by it, mm -hmm. as they're fascinated by celebrity, as they're fascinated mm -hmm. by a lot of entertainment, you know. Um, and what I do is I, I use it as an entry point. The thing, if, it, if that's what gets me in, that's fine. Uh, I say that it, it was invaluable for me. I wouldn't have chosen any other way to come up. I wouldn't know the people I know. I am closer to some people in this community than I am to members of my own family. Mm. You know, I mean, we just all kind of grew up together. I got children who have gone into <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> Taking over the family <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's, it, it, can be, uh, it can be an albatross. I tell people who are in it now, uh, be prepared. You will never shake it. Mm. If you make any kind of name for yourself while you're doing it, for that will be who you are. Mm. Uh, I remember having a couple of books out and being on my first AWP panel and being so thrilled. And so they're going down the, the you know the, the uh, row and they're introducing. Oh, 
It's Molly Peacock. It's, you know, Tom Slay. You know, and they get to me and they go, and Patricia Smith, slam poet. And then you realize that we were first used for entertainment. Mm -hmm. We have a dead ass panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we add a slam poet, people will come and, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, True we, were, we were really kind of, and so you have to kind of force and say, thank you. I'll be reading from my book. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 you know. Uh, you know, and I, I was in something one time and Billy Collins was there. And uh, he really just kind of came up to me because I was doing the same thing he was doing. We were both teaching at this thing. And he came up to me just confounded. And he said, I don't know you. And the way he said it was like, you have not been legitimized with me. Oh. I, you know, are you making money? I'm making money. Are you, you, you know? <laughs> so a lot of that, uh, if they're looking for a way to belittle you, uh -huh. oh, you're that slam yeah. poet. Uh -huh. right. You're that performer. Can you tell me, do you study theater? You know, it's all, it's all toward performance and away from your poetry. Mm -hmm. And the best revenge ever is to just write the shit out of your poem. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> well, they're just like, you know, uh, yeah. you know, and they, they, you know, something blows out of their head, and then, they, uh, <laughs> but, but, but to just, to, just to make sure, yes, I know how to read my, but there is, I can't craft this any better hmm. than I have. I know, and and to know yourself, this is you, you cannot, this is, you can't argue with this right now. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and and little by little they'll come to realize that there has to be a space for us, no matter where we came from. But, you know, we didn't go to Iowa. You know, yeah. we didn't win XX. Well, you've won all the awards, but <laughs> XXX award. I was like, uh, I was online. I said, is this Negro in England? <laughs> <laughs> winning the forward, pro winning, and you know, it's like, <laughs> 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 what, what? But you know, you know, and so that's where it happens. That's when you know, hey, no argument here. But I, yeah. but you know, and before we switch into the game, I think based on what you said, I think you know, I feel like every time I see you, I owe you a thank you, because if you look sure. at the current fabric of American poetry, how much people like me and Franny and all these other folks who have started in Slam and moved towards something else that is truly, it's it's different than it was 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And. Anytime I pinpoint it, it's you who changed that fabric. Mm -hmm. You showed all of us who were in SLAM, who wanted to imagine ourselves as bigger and better, or just not as one type of poet, mm -hmm. right? You're that map for us. Yeah. What you did, and I think you braving into it and really changing, like, you know, you, you fuck shit up. Um, and with the books that you wrote and all your, your quest to be a better poet and a poet that didn't forget about that there were real communities out there that needed poetry, you're that map for us. You, I mean, I'm about to cry, but I really feel you have changed the texture and the fabric of American poetry. So I just want to thank you for being brave. Thank, and thank like, you, love. And opening that door for all of us. Thank you so all right. much, Chase. So let's thank play you. a game. So let's play a game. Okay, so on every episode of Versus, we like to play our little game called This Versus That. Thank you for bringing a house slice up. Yes, um, right. Where we like to put, you know, two people, concepts, places, things, you know, nouns and shit, um, in, a, in a battle and decide who would win in a fight, a physical fight. Hi, Nouns and shit. Um, <laughs> so, um, because, you know, because these motherfuckers won't stop bringing it up in our interviews and stuff like that, we're just gonna go ahead and invite Paige and stage onto the uh, into the forum today, um, so they can finally just go ahead and duke it the fuck out. So right. um, we're gonna put, but we're gonna do it slightly different. So normally we do in a fight, and we're today we're gonna ask you three. We're gonna put page and stage in three different competitions. Three so rounds. Want, three rounds. Three rounds. Things. Slam. It's like a decathlon, you know, a triathlon. Yeah, uh, triathlon. A triathlon. That's triathlon. Right. Yeah, math, Greek. It works. Uh, cool. <laughs> So we're gonna put page and stage into a triathlon and see who really comes out on top, once and for all, just to settle this bullshit, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so you get to think about your answer. Audience, we also wanna hear from you um, who would win in this fight and these other things, okay? Yep. Is that cool, y'all ready? Yep. It's participation time, step up to the plate. All right, all cool. Right. So the, um, the first round is a physical fight. Yes. Who would win in a, in a, in a physical fight between the 
stage poem and yeah. the page poem. Yeah. Not that those, I, I love, love how we like broke down the boundary and we were like, or the binary, and then we were like, okay, binary time. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the binary. <laughs> yeah. But it's a game. Uh, yeah, it's a game. yeah, it's a game. So yeah, who would win in a physical fight, the spoken word poem or the poem on the page? You think about it, let's go to the audience. Yes, okay, so uh, make some noise if you think that the spoken word poem is going to win in this fight. Woo! Okay, okay. All right, and then make some noise if you think that the artfully crafted page poem is winning in the fight. Woo! <laughs> People in the MFA programs are like, yeah, please, please, a please. Little, maybe. <laughs> oh, Patricia. wow. Miss Smith? Um, I was going to say the page poem because it has grant money. Ah! <laughs> 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 <It's> got... <laughs> It's got backers. It's got a lot of yeah. people in his corner. Right. Page He's pumpkin like, corner like, trainer. It's like Rocky Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think the page poem would win initially, and then after the whole show was over, out back, the spoken word part would be, <laughs> would get it out behind the dumpster and beat its ass. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, round. So wait, so then who 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 wins that round? So now it's I think it's Page. It's Page. So Page, page one, stage zero. Okay, great. Spoken word poets keep hope. All okay. right, round two is who wins the <laughs> Democratic primary nomination between the Page poem and the stage poem. Okay, so make some noise if you think the spoken word poem is the nominee for the for the for candidate for the for the Democratic primary. Woo! Okay, and make some noise if uh, it's page poem 2020. <laughs> Y'all tripping, split. Americans don't read. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patricia, who's wearing, winning the I Democratic- I want to have a beer with the spoken word poem, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> who's winning the Democratic primary nomination? Yeah, see, I think Biden is the page poem. Woo! Um, I'm gonna say the spoken word poem. <laughs> Woo! We need, All right. <laughs> we, need, we need some chaos. We need some. <laughs> those straight little lines will not be getting it. All right, we're at 1-1 one, one now. Okay, we're at 1-1. Okay. One, one. One, one. One, and then one. the final round is who wins versus page poem, page poem versus stage poem, who wins your hand in marriage? Who are you marrying? So make some noise if you're marrying the spoken word poem. Damn! Okay. Okay, no, no, okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, and then make some noise if you're marrying the artfully crafted page poem. Woo! <laughs> wow! Woo! Amazing. Wow. Did, any, did anybody else have, like, actual poets in their head? <laughs> because I have poets in my head, and it's like, whoa, Look, let's see now. Well, see, my thing was I can close a bad book, but I can't really get out of a bad spoken word poem once it's going. It's hard oh, to walk wow. out. I thought you were going to say I can close a bad book, but I... But I can't op I can't I can't walk open out on bad it. I don't know. Yeah, it was <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh wow. I Ooh, have a man. poet like in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a page poet. Uh okay, let me let me get a spoken word. Wait, poet. in a good way or a uh... <laughs> <laughs> Let me let me get a spoken word poet in my head now. <laughs> you know what? When I when I drink, which is seldom, uh I always, we do it, we play a game. It's like, uh, we do a men of poetry calendar. Oh, oh we have done this before. I've yes. done this with you. <laughs> yeah. Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> that nest wants to be July. Um, oh, I just want to curate August. in oil. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to say a uh, page poet because we need a paycheck. <laughs> wow. wow. Super, All super right. real. We so, need to eat. Damn. <laughs> uh, we can't. In, in ramen a, only goes so far. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a turn of events, y'all, um, page poetry has won the day. Uh, <laughs> Books over yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. I guess. Bo bo <laughs> Books sell, pass the hats, do not make the rent. Um, Patricia, thank you so very much. You are welcome. Thank you, guys. I can see you now. Thank you all. For <laughs> thank you all for coming. Patricia Smith, everybody. That was really cool. Thank you. Yeah.